moderator today. Uh, and this, of course, we're talking about the right to privacy versus the public's right to know. Um, the right to privacy sometimes gets lost. It's, it's a fairly recent um, right. It's only been articulated and defined for about the last 100 years. So I'd like to have you think of the right to privacy simply as uh, the right to be left alone. If you think of anything that touches you that uh, you'd rather not, you'd just rather be left alone either by the government, by your neighbor, by the local newspaper, whatever it may be. That is your right uh, to maintain your independence. Um, a great jurist, Louis Brandeis, co-authored a Harvard Law Review article way back in 1890 uh, in which he, uh, he defined uh, the right to know. And later, after he had become a, um, a, a very established jurist, he said that this was the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men. And he lived long enough ago uh, that he didn't understand there were also civilized women. So I think he would have said it would be the right most valued by civilized men and women. Um, we will be asking our panelists to respond to the, uh, uh, the, this morning's debate. Uh, Jack Van Falkenberg from the ACLU. Did most of you attend this morning's debate? Good, good. Um, and I will just summarize quickly. Um, he said, the things that stuck with me, the Constitution offers little protection for privacy. Remember he talked about um, the bigger monster uh, being the government and uh, with a weaker chain being the, the chain that was straining restraining the, the government from intrusion and is concerned about increasing government intrusion into the lives of uh, individuals. And Jack this morning said that we need privacy laws, that every civilized country except ours uh, does have uh, stronger laws on the books related to privacy. Jeff Jacoby, uh, speaking from a more conservative point of view, said, told us that the civil liberties uh, are alive and well in our country, uh, which was good to hear. Um, I hope he's right. Um, Jeff supported the Patriot Act and uh, had some criticisms to, um, uh, towards the McCain-Feingold Act. And he said the greatest threat to our freedoms is not reasonable laws passed after 9-11, but the greatest threat was another terrorist act that could uh, be yet to come. Jack has just come in. Would you like to join our panelists on the, you, you have your choice. You can be in the audience. You can join. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jeff. Uh, uh, this is Jack Van Valkenburg. And um, uh, Jeff Jacoby uh, has already caught a plane and is on his way back to uh, Massachusetts. So, Jack, we'll just clue you in here. Uh, the basic question is how can we maintain individual freedom along with the safety, security, and well-being of, of the greater society? Um, and um, following along, when is governmental intrusion too much and when is it wrong? I'd just like to list quickly some broader issues that than what were, was, were discussed this morning. Uh, that was a lot about the Patriot Act and certain amount about security following 9-11, but also um, issues that come under the question of right to, peer, to privacy, um, use of personal data, your bank account, your um, medical record, your credit rating, maybe what you're watching, buying, a, a, a renting at, at the video store, books taken out at the library, your social service records, uh, the whole area of drug and AIDS testing, polygraph tests, you know, when, when is this okay and when is it too much, who should it apply to, who should be protected. Um, some other rights, right to smoke, right to die, right to reproductive freedom. Uh, you can see how this is a really broad area and uh, we will invite our panel to not only respond to this morning's uh, discussion, but to bring up their questions of their own concern 
uh, and uh, um, their own thoughts about the, the right to privacy. So we'll have um, about 30 minutes for a round for each of them to take as long as they want, if it's not over five minutes. And then we'll uh, give them a chance to ask each other a question, and then we'll open it up, questions to you. Let me introduce them briefly, then I'll ask them to give, uh, when they talk, a little longer uh, description of it, uh, themselves. Right here, uh, to my immediate left, is Bob Bennett, who is an NIC English instructor. Uh, next to him is Amy Mossberg, who is um, Associated Student Body Senator from NIC. And then we have uh, Vinny Zito, who is past president of the NIC Republican, Young Republican Club. And then uh, Julie uh, uh, Tiger Legart. Did I say it right? She teaches history at NIC. And on the end, Buell Hollister, who is a board member of the local, local a resident who is a board member of the state American Civil Liberties Union. So with no further ado, Bob, would you start? And then let's just go around uh, while I sit down. So the mic is, I think, yours, and this will okay. cool off. You know, I didn't prepare any uh, opening statements other than I, I had some questions sort of in response to the whole topic. And one of the observations, I guess, about this morning's um, uh, debate really is that uh, the two gentlemen were closer in some issues than I thought that they might be when I walked in. Um, but I had some questions uh, just with regard to privacy, and, and so I'll kind of run through a few of those to start with. Um, the one that strikes me, I guess, first is who provides checks and balances for government access to citizens' privacy? And the reason that I, that I asked that question is I think initially, you know, uh, the government does have more access, it seems, as of late to personal records, to uh, information about us. And um, I wonder who's sort of checking on them at the same time. There's been a couple of things recently that have suggested that some of that information is uh, not in the safest sort of places and that it's been shared with people that maybe we all don't want, want it to be shared with. So that's one of the questions that I have. A um, couple of others. What happens if the government, um, if what the government finds becomes public, um, how does that impact us as private individuals? Um, and that I read in the paper the other day where there was a, a group of uh, conservatives that were actually moving to um, uh, push the sunset on some of the Patriot Act, which I thought was, uh, was an interesting um, kind of direction. And I wanted to ask you about that as well, um, because I, maybe that's not traditional in terms of what we might think about conservative versus liberal voices on the matter. So that was something that I thought was kind of interesting. The Choice Point um, thing that's going on with Choice Point, uh, and you both mentioned that I think this morning, with Choice Point selling private information to um, to what turned out to be uh, kind of a criminal group, and um, that concerns me, I guess, what happens to the private information of individuals that's collected by the government uh, after the fact and, and what can be done with that. It's, I guess especially in, uh, in part due to uh, the stuff that we hear about today with identity theft and uh, what can happen as a result of that to all of us. Um, so I guess those are some of the questions that I guess I, I would start with that, uh, that maybe we can kick around as, as a panel. Um, I would have to actually agree with him. That was a lot of um, what I wanted to say as far as the checks and balances. Like I said in my um, question this morning um, when I asked them was um, I started out by stating that I think I, I would speak for all of us that that's why we love this country so much is because of our freedom. And um, at the same time, uh, we want to uh, be protected and um, feel safe. But the, um, we want our privacy as well. And so that's where, um, like, like he said, both these speakers, I think, have a lot of um, uh, points that they agree on. It's, it's, I think, basically on the limits on where we draw the lines for these things. Um, so I don't really have any more questions for them, per se. 
Mine are the people that run um, for more of like the government themselves that um, initiate this, the process and everything that um, this goes through is, you know, like I said, the limits and where we draw the lines. So um, I don't know, I, g I don't really have any more questions. It's just uh, once these are carried out, um, you know, what do we, what do we do with them? And the other thing I didn't like was, and I, I, that was my question this morning, was what does this information uh, and the Patriot Act especially have to do with um, businesses and public organizations having um, this vital stuff? Yes, they mentioned this morning that they already have it because we're consumers. They have basic information about us, but um, I, I, I think it should stay basic, so. Um, I don't know. That's all I have to say. So, go ahead. All right. Um, myself as well, I didn't really prepare anything uh, for an opening speech. Um, I just wanted to say, basically, you know, this is, this is more than just the Patriot Act, and we did allude to that a little earlier, uh, Mary Lou. Um, you know, we have to also look at other things. Um, for instance, sex offenders. You know, is it our right to know if a sex offender is living next door. And I personally think that that is our right. I and mean, I think that we should know. I mean, um, there's a, a case that just happened last week with a little girl in Florida. I believe it was last week or possibly a few weeks ago in Florida that there was a registered sex offender who was visiting his sister in Florida. And actually, he kind of visited the area and he scoped out the area and he found this little girl. I believe she was around 14 years old, something around that age. But he basically raped her and he killed her. And had the community known, they could have kept a watchful eye out for that person. So um, there's just a lot of different issues. It's not just the Patriot Act. Um, there's also adoption issues, uh, parents' right to know, um, the actual child who is being adopted's right to know, um, who their parent was. Um, you have to look at different, different facets. It's, it's, not, it's a very complex issue. It's not just a simple, just cut and dry issue. There's donors, organ donors privacy issues there. Um, there are some religions that are out there that do not believe in, you know, if you're buried, you're buried whole altogether. And if that gets out there that you're a donator or a donor, then you might be more inclined to not donate your organs. You know, myself, I'm Catholic, but I also believe in donating organs if I can save someone else's life completely. Um, another thing that we have to remember, there was a lot of uh, illusion or you alluding th this morning to this being an administration, a Bush administration um, issue. Um, I think you actually said it was Bush-inspired Patriot Act. Well, the Patriot Act was actually, um, one of the co-authors of it was a Democrat from Florida. He's a senator. His name is um, George, oh, I'm sorry, Bob Graham from Florida. He's a Democrat. He's a co-writer of the Patriot Act. So this isn't just a Bush administration thing. This is bipartisan, as well as the opposition to it was bipartisan. So it's not just a Democrat-Republican thing. Um, so I wanted to clear that up a little bit. Um, also, there are some things within the Patriot Act that were actually started by, not called the Patriot Act, but actually started by the uh, previous administration, the Clinton administration. And one of them would be I can get to that a little bit later. But one of them is an anti-terrorism uh, act. And that was actually started by uh, Bill Clinton in the Clinton <laughs> administration. So I don't think it is a, a Bush agenda as far as, you're, as you were pushing it earlier today. Um, let's see. Yeah, and that's about, <laughs> that's about all. Um, I want to also finish with this is, again, we did allude to it. Uh, just a few minutes ago, the corporate response. I'd like to know how the corporate world is, you know, taking their, I don't know how, how many of you guys come from the corporate world or not, um, but when you go into the corporate world, they ask you questionnaires, they have your, all of your information, and I'd like to know if they're acting in a responsible way to keep that private. I would, I would, uh, I don't know if you know the answer to that. But I would like to, uh, I'd like to find out about that and see how responsible they are. I'm sure that there is some type of, uh, of fail-safe in there to keep it from getting out. 
But um, anyway, so that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I'm a history instructor here at North Idaho College, and so I did prepare remarks because I just couldn't let this go without kind of providing the historical perspective on this issue. And as we look at the concept of an individual's right to privacy versus the public's right to know information, especially information which might put them in danger, I just wanted to ask you to consider um, a few um, facts that show us that this really isn't a new debate in our country. Several examples from history might actually shed light on this issue. In the late 1790s, to start with, political debate was actually quelled as a result of the Sedition Act. This led to the arrest, detention, and investigation of many journalists who didn't agree with the current Federalist administration's administration. Um, this brought the private as well as the public affairs of these journalists into question and they were detained, many of them, for an indeterminate amount of time. During World War I, the Department of Justice and then a private group of 250,000 American citizens, which was called the American Protective League, investigated and arrested any person who seemed to be against the war effort. Their methods, and I think this is kind of interesting in light of the methods that are being used in the Patriot Act, um, were personal interviews, wiretaps and telephone lines, and interception of the mail of thousands of suspicious persons. German nationals, members of organized labor groups, and political dis dissidents such as socialists were particularly targeted, and their personal lives were put under a microscope. The so-called Red Scare, the communist scare of 1919 right after World War I, led to the deportation of hundreds of alien political dissidents and the arrest and detention of thousands more. In fact, American elected officials from several states, Congress people and senators, um, were expelled from office simply because of their party affiliation and loyalty oaths were imposed on many public um, employees. In 1950, Congress passed the Internal Security Act, which among other things created a subversive activities control board to monitor the activities of communist organizations. Um, it also permitted the arrest of suspected dissidents even without their committing illegal acts. This bill, among other factors, gave rise to the House Un-American Activities Committee, which most of you have probably heard of, led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, in which Hollywood writers, directors, and actors were investigated and forced to testify about their participation in communist organizations. In all of the above cases, the measures were later seen to be excessive and intrusive upon the indiv individual rights of the people involved. For example, we now know that few, if any, German nationals during World War I were actually actively involved in the German war effort. It has never been proved that the, any of the illegal um, immigrants, or any of the if deported immigrants, not illegal immigrants, of 1919 were actually plotting against the United States. And finally, Senator Joseph McCarthy was ultimately censured by the Senate itself for bringing dishonor and disrepute upon their organization. Without exception, the historical perspective on these episodes is that the perceived danger did not ultimately outweigh the civil rights abuses perpetuated against these innocents. That said, the right to privacy, I think, is a really tricky issue because Amendment 4 of the Constitution, which is largely assumed to guarantee privacy, doesn't actually state that it guarantees privacy. Rather, it protects individuals against unreasonable searches and seizures. The definition of unreasonable is therefore open to debate and has been vigorously debated throughout our country's history. Further, there has long been a line drawn between the normal definitions of unreasonable search and seizure and the definitions used during times of national emergency. So where does this leave us in our current discussion? Um, the debate this morning provided me with a lot of food for thought because nobody denies the national security issues raised by the success of the attacks in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. As Mr. Jacoby this morning pointed out, it's extremely frightening to acknowledge that we had actually granted these terrorists the right to live in this country. Um, it would be naive to say that we don't need to take strong measures to prevent a future similar attack. 
but what form should they, these measures take? Is the Patriot Act in its entirety trying to keep us safe at the expense of our individual privacy? And I think that's kind of what we were talking about this morning. And I would contend that the possibility definitely exists. Both speakers this morning acknowledged that the Patriot Act increases the government's access to our personal data at the same time as it becomes more difficult for us to gain access to government information. In the same manner as political dissidents were profiled during the 1950s by their party affiliation, this information could now be used to profile suspected terrorists using their political, religious, and racial categories. Add to that the sheer volume of information that is now available about any one of us on the internet and in other arenas, and I think the situation could get really volatile. The potential for abuse of our Fourth Amendment right to protection against the unreasonable search of our papers and other effects is real, especially if we are considered to be in a potentially high-risk group. I'd finally like to address the most fundamental right, um, privacy right promised by the Fourth Amendment, that of the protection of our persons against unreasonable search or seizure. As many of you know, hundreds of suspected terrorists were detained by the United States government in the wake of 9-11 and have been detained now for over three years. For the past year, government tribunals have been holding hearings aimed at discovering whether or not these individuals actually pose a threat to national security. Time Magazine addressed this issue in a January 31, 2005 article. The article states that of the 567 original detainees, 36 have now been recommended for reclassification as non-enemy combatants. In other words, they don't, um, they don't present a danger and they should be free to go. But of these 36, only one has been released to date. The other 35 will remain in detention while the CIA and other intelligence agencies continue to search for additional incriminating evidence. Only after a second hearing and a second approval from the tribunal will these individuals be granted their freedom. While we don't want to release incipient terrorists, we still need to consider the rights of the potential innocents being detained. An observer of the situation, um, who is a representative of the, of the American Bar Association, has stated that we should do anything possible to be sure that we don't detain innocent people one minute longer than we have to. In light of the historical examples with which I began, I fear that one day we will look back on situations such as these with exactly the same regret as we look back on the persecution of Germans during World War I. Fourth Amendment rights must be protected to avoid just this possibility. Well, <clears throat> to repeat what you really said, it, there, there's a, there has been a consistent pattern of the abridgment of uh, privacy and civil liberties in the time of war. And as Mr. J uh, Jacoby indicated this morning, it, it had generally had public support. Uh, of course, I don't think that that's a rational justification for it, just because it has public support. The public generally supported the restrictive measures that had been earlier referred to. There's a, there's a measure that hasn't been uh, discussed, and that's the uh, national, uh, <clears throat> national Security Intelligence Reform Act, and, and there's a, there will be a, issued a federal driver's license, it'll have the state stamp on it, but there will be a magnetic strip containing a chip with uh, biometric information of the holder and uh, uh, other sensitive information that uh, will go into the database, which undoubtedly will be accessed by those who have a vested interest in acquiring that information. Uh, employers and direct mailers and uh, health care providers and so forth. Privacy is, uh, is at risk when uh, we surf the internet, shop at a supermarket, use a credit card. All that personal uh, data is collected and uh, certainly is subject to sale. There's an intrusion in our health care uh, process when uh, uh, valuable health care uh, information is put into a database which is uh, accessible to the uh, uh, insurers that have that information, which is, uh, of course, predicated on risk. We have to acknowledge the role of corporations in this whole process, the link between the corporations and government activity. We all know that corporations regularly support both political parties. 
And in our hyper-commercial culture, uh, we, we have uh, been trained pretty much to be consumers rather than responsible citizens. And of course, that makes it easier for these activities to, cons uh, to occur. We think of ourselves as consumers uh, rather than citizens who are assiduous about informing ourselves of uh, important issues that affect public life. And uh, we, we have to be vigilant about holding the corporations accountable, about protecting our right to privacy. That, uh, you know, we just, we just have to uh, be more vigilant about our responsibility as citizens. Then we certainly would not be as easily manipulated when times of crisis like this arise. Whoops, thank you. Whoop, didn't mean to hit your ears there. Uh, thanks to each of you for your good responses. Let's go back to some of the earlier questions that you may want to address uh, to Jack, and we'll spend uh, a few minutes, maybe 15 or so, in which you are all responding. I mean, Jack, could, you could address the questions to Jack, but I suspect that you may ha also have some of your own opinions. So, Bob, do you want to, uh, you had your question about checks and balances and do you want to uh, re repeat those, please? Sure. Um, what I started with was I was wondering, you know, as I, w as I was listening this morning, I was thinking about uh, how much access the government has into our information and how little we are able to understand or see what the government's doing. And I was just wondering um, if you could comment on that or if you had any thoughts about that in terms of, you know, checks and balances for the government sure. um, and, and their ability to access information. Right. Um, well, let me put it in, in context of uh, uh, first um, uh, Mary Lou's phrasing and the whole morning session being about privacy versus the, the right to know. And as I said this morning, um, the ACLU and I think all of us are for our ability to know what the government is doing unless there's national security or trade secret information, but generally to know what the government is doing is very important. What this um, morning session and, this, and the panel is about is more talking about the privacy versus the government's right to know what we're doing so as to protect everybody from, from the dangers of, of everything and, and uh, the dangers of, of terrorism or, or, or crime. Um, and getting to the checks and balances question, um, I would first say that, you know, we do have, thank goodness, uh, a tripartite system where the, uh, there's the judiciary, the congressional and, and administrative branches of government. And it's important that we uh, keep those strong and keep those separate and make sure there is at least the judiciary to check the power of the government to, through legislation, violate um, their constitutional rights or through uh, executive actions or administrative actions uh, violate constitutional rights. Um, and I think we don't, I mean, uh, to do a little plug for my own organization, uh, people tend to be fearful of the ACLU as if we're threatening to try to take over the world or something. We don't want to. We want to be a check. That we are here to be a check against the power of government. And because the government is too, uh, is elected, if, thank goodness, it's a democracy. And our leaders want to be reelected generally. So they act in accord with the majority's wishes. Um, sometimes individual freedoms, which are those things that the minority has a right to, as well as the majority, can be trampled or can be at least ignored or can be at least, you know, tread upon. And that's why we need an organization that is independent and willing to go up against the government on behalf of individuals and on behalf of a very unpopular minority. Because that's, and that's why I think we are as unpopular as we are is because we're identified with whatever unpopular minority we happen to be trying to protect their core individual freedoms of. Um, and getting to the checks and balances with respect to Oh, government um, and private interests uh, invading our space and our 
and learning about us. Um, as I said this morning, there are not constitutional protections to a great extent um, to protect any of us from that level of inquiry, so long as it's not the government that's invading, or so long as it's not the government that's wiretapping or that's collecting that information, um, you don't really have a Fourth Amendment, and that's the only privacy protections uh, one can use in this context. Um, you don't really have a claim that the government is unreasonably searching or seizing any records. There is no bar in this democracy that's of uh, that is to protect private property. You know, we are an, uh, a country that prides itself on property rights and business property rights and businesses' rights to collect information. Um, without laws, and I spoke this morning of the consumer protection laws that other countries have, we are the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have good privacy protections. And I think it's, um, it's time, it's gonna, I don't, you know, I don't think anything is even being offered in Congress. I mean, it is so hard to buck the business interest when you want to invade their, quote, right to collect the information, to disseminate the information, to sell the information, to take advantage of that information. And then you have the government's interest um, in, in getting the information too because one of the points I don't know if I made clear this morning was that our Bush administration, excuse me, um, is looking to enforce or to protect ourselves from terrorist attacks more by the, well, both. I, I, I don't want to say, but they are emphasizing too much collecting information about everybody, everybody, no matter how innocent you are, and no matter how you have never done anything to cause anybody suspicion. But nevertheless, they want to get all of those private records about you, and they want to mill it the way that Choice Point mills, so that they can sell that information to the government. Well, they want to mill it to see whether, of course, you're a, uh, a terrorist. Well, that makes sense. I mean, that's, uh, maybe it's not intrusive in some sense, but how do you, what if you're incorrectly labeled? I mean, these people who can't fly, there's a no-fly list. I mean, I think, uh, I know the executive director, Anthony Romero, because of his name, uh, the ACLU executive director, was on a no-fly list. The Teddy Kennedy was on a no-fly list. All kinds of, excuse me. Um, I meant to kill this. No, I'll just let it go. That sounds good. <laughs> So we need checks and balances, and I think the only way with in our constitutional framework is to have uh, laws um, that protect. I mean, as much as the ACLU is viewed as anti-government, or you know, it's we're not we're not for anarchy. We want we want legal protections, especially when it comes to privacy. And I think um, with enough of these abuses people are going to get angry and people are going to demand that, hey, there's no reason why without my consent, without my even notification, hey, there it goes again. Um, must be a very important civil liberties crisis happening somewhere. <laughs> Let's hope. This is actually the kind of claustrophobic play against the Patriot Act. Yeah, maybe that's what they're doing. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, 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 I guess I've made my point that I, I, those are the checks, and once you have the laws, then you have the judiciary to enforce it. Um, I wanted just to remark on something you said because I think it's kind of ironic when you said that you know, the ACLU executive director was on a no-fly list because of his last name. I think that one thing I didn't mention um, during my, my remarks was that during World War II, and I'm sure everyone's aware of this, that we did detain um, Japanese Americans, um, most of whom, by the way, were citizens of this country, not aliens, not immigrants. 
Um, but native born, yes, many who were the you know sons and daughters of people who had come here and were born in the Amer in the United States were property holders, um, owned their homes, owned businesses, and they were detained. And only just in 1988 were they given reparations, and it is now seen as a national disgrace that this happened. And yet here we are. And yet at that very same time, um, those Japanese Americans who were fighting for the United States were. Um, percentage-wise, the most decorated ethnic group um, for bravery on the field of combat on behalf of the United States during the, during the entire war. And yet it seems to me that we're getting back to this kind of ethnic profiling, this kind of racial stereotyping, while at the same time we're protecting business by not doing things that seem to me to be very logical. For example, we are still not searching each and every bit of baggage that goes on an airline because people don't want to wait. The flights, they don't want to wait for late flights. And so it does seem to me that we're still protecting business even though we want to increase this haystack um, and doing it in ways that I think history has shown us are embarrassing to us. Would you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm so I have my own. <laughs> um, yeah, and on the comment about racial profiling, I would point out that yes, we don't, put people in internment camps in this country, but we do deport them. Um, and hundreds have been deported. As I mentioned this morning, the Justice Department was bragging about it because after 9-11 they got all these, these people who were immigrants and they deported them as if that showed some connection to fighting terrorism when none of them were even charged with anything to do with terrorism. Um, they are using the immigration laws now to uh, have people who were for uh, many years here on a student visa or something and they had not properly checked all the T's and dotted the I's, um, now are in violation of their status and, and have been sent back. And you know, maybe that's a good thing to crack down and make sure that those T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, but it's being used because folks in the administration think that these immigrants are the trouble. And some are. 9-11 hijackers were not white Americans, but Oklahoma bombers were. That was what, that's when Bill Clinton passed the, uh, got that other terrorism act passed. I think that was a result of the, of the Oklahoma City bombing thing. And whenever there is a major disaster that's brought by uh, a criminal element, or a terrorist element, you can expect to see Congress act to crack down on people's rights because why did it happen? What are they there for? There's gotta be a reason that they can, there's gotta be something they can do and they want to act like or sound like or look like they're, they're actually doing something when sometimes the laws are there. And I, th you know, we can talk about 9-11 and I can, I'm convinced that 9-11 was preventable. It was, it was sloppiness. It was Richard Clark's memorandums as the National Security Advisor being ignored by Condi Rice and the demands to get a meeting at high levels and he could not get the message out that Iraq is, I, that these, they're not Iraq, good grief, now I'm doing, <laughs> now I'm doing. <laughs> it's, uh, I've been planted, ah, Iraq is the core, <laughs> that Al-Qaeda is, uh, is, is really a threat and that they, they were really, had, they were, they were, had big designs and there was the FBI uh, reports in the southwest of, of, of Arabs wanting to learn to fly planes and not wanting to know how to take off or land. They just want to know how to fly. And this stuff just gets ignored. There was it. The Patriot Act wasn't needed to build, to knock down any barriers of information. It was simply stupidity. And it should not, that's what we've got to be professional. I, the FBI is a, has a huge challenge and I'm all for them and, uh, in the context of their mission. But they have got to stand up to the job now with terrorism, they have got to be professional. You don't go busting Sami al Hussein, who didn't do anything because he looked because he, he was a Muslim and because he was involved in computers, um, and without much more evidence than that, 
and you charge him with immigration charges, and it takes months before you can even trump up a terrorist charge, which quickly gets rejected by the jury. Um, you know, we've got to demand that our administration, our, our FBI agencies, and these others really do a good job, and we can get to it. I have totally gone off subject. I, th I think we like it when you go off the subject. It gets really lively and interesting, right? Uh, Amy, did you want to follow up on your questions, or did he respond sufficiently on the balance? Um, uh, did I? <laughs> what was it? Um, what was that question? Yeah, my thing was um, pretty much with his, um, it was, you know, where do we draw the lines? And as well, um, not that I disagree at all as to what you two have been talking about, but if we don't make that haystack bigger, um, not that I'm suggesting it does, but how do we go about this? And also not that you would have the ultimate answer, but um, I mean, there has to be a way uh, still to, um, I mean, with all everything that is, you know, advances in technology and everything that we have, yet we still, you know, are so vulnerable, you know? So how, I guess more of comments, not the actual answer of, of what you would be possibly suggesting. And is it just more keeping it in check or? Well, who was it who said, you know, the first thing about war is to know thy enemy. And I think um, this administration has failed utterly to attempt to know thy enemy. Uh, to understand where they're coming from. I heard two days ago on NPR this report, and it was predictable. Richard Clark has been saying it since he left the administration that Al Qaeda once was more like a tower, and we could knock it out. Now it's diffused, and now it's a movement, NPR said. It's a movement. We have created a movement. I think it's we. I think it's because we have not <coughs> worked with understanding, work to understand what it is that has caused this hatred and this uh, obsession with, with taking us down. And I think we, the sooner we get serious about understanding it um, and, and, and doing what we can to convince the, you know, I'm really talking about now the not domestic, I guess, but it all is rooted in this international problem, um, and we have to um, we have to sh model the people we are, and we don't do that by committing torture. Uh, Bin Laden is and his people are are promoting. Um, look at what Americans doing now. Look what, look at the torture they're doing, you know, and because we're sending these people to other countries so that they can be tortured. We are doing that. And that is going to get anywhere. It's going to build that movement. So I, I just think we've got to think wiser. Well, uh, Vinny, you, uh, as the, the former Republican uh, head, uh, do you want to respond to some of that? You also brought up some really interesting other issues, the adoption and uh, organ donors, et cetera. So uh, you take your choice. Actually, I just uh, had a real quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned that the ACLU, um, the chair, said that he couldn't fly, he's on a no-fly list. Have you contacted the Department of Transportation on that? And what was the guy's name who's the head of that? There's uh, the head of the trans Department of Transportation? Mineta, Mineta and he is Japanese-American, correct? Um, Do you have any response? Personally, I haven't. Yeah, I know that actually his name was mistaken it wasn't even the same name. His name is Romero, and it was Romera or something, but they still stopped him. Um, he hasn't had that problem again because, as I understand it, because of that. Now, people like Ed Kennedy, I don't know about these others, and, and folks who really do have a name that is said to be the name of a terrorist. The problem with all of this is when they do contact, they can't get off that no-fly list. There is no route to get off the no-fly list. I haven't heard of anybody getting off the no-fly list, and I've heard of people trying and failing. So, you know, I don't know. That's the only answer I can give. Okay, Buell, were you just about to say something? 
Yeah, and I haven't forgotten it, incidentally. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, Jack, I appreciate you bringing up the fact that there was enough warning about something was coming down. Uh, George Tennant went to Crawford and talked to uh, President, uh, then President, pre-President Bush about this. My, my question, and incidentally, there's been a number of books written on this issue. War on Freedom is one. The other one was the second Pearl Harbor. So there's a lot of, and Gore Vidal's book, Dreaming of War. There's a lot of literature out there on this subject. But this morning, uh, Jeff Jacoby brought up the, uh, the fact, evidently in, in, imbuing some kind of comfort, that the four, if, if they've been, these people have been illegally de uh, detained, ultimately the courts will reverse that process. And I just wanted to know, what, what is your response to that, uh, rather Pablum uh, response to that? Yeah, I wasn't sure exactly what he was referring to, but um, he, he was just expressing, uh, my sense of it was expressing faith in our government that the system works, et cetera. And it works for most of us. It works for most of us who are here in Coeur d'Alene or are privileged in other ways. It doesn't work so well for immigrants, um, and they they get deported, and they don't even get deported until months, if not a year or more, after they have been detained in cells, and you know their family doesn't know where they are, et cetera. Um, I don't think that's working. You know, I th I think that uh, fortunately it does work in certain ways. However, I mean we do have. It, there are people, from an individual context, it, it doesn't always work. The, the big picture, you know, we live in a great country. This is, it's fabulous to have the U.S. Supreme Court and the lower courts, et cetera. And it's fabulous that the U.S. Supreme Court, um, you know, stuck it to the Bush administration with respect to the Guantanamo detainees and with respect to Padilla and these others who were being detained because they were perhaps enemy combatants, an invented term, without due process, without the right to a lawyer, without the right to be charged, and for months after months until they can finally get to the US Supreme Court and get a ruling that says, my goodness, this is America. You don't do this. If you are detained, you're going to get the right, all the criminal protections. That's what our due process protections are all about. So, you know, it took a couple of, how long, you know? It took three years before the uh, Supreme Court could rule on that. But, you know, it, the big picture, if you step back, is that the system works. For a lot of individuals, they fall through the cracks. Thank you. I think it's about time to turn questions over to the audience, but would you clarify one point, Jack? Uh, I think because uh, Sam is at Moscow, University of Idaho, so close to um, to our area, would you explain the role ACLU played or at least perhaps explain a little bit more what happened in that okay. particular case? Yeah, this is a, uh, a very important uh, case nationally. Uh, the prosecution of Sami al Hussein started, I think, in 93, was it in spring? Maybe some of you were in Moscow, but um, I understand uh, hundreds, I believe, of FBI agents showed up in, uh, at, in the uh, parking lot of a daycare center uh, that day and uh, were targeting uh, and did arrest Sami al Hussein, an uh, Arab born, Saudi Arabian, I should say, uh, graduate student in computer science, getting his PhD just a couple of months away from getting his PhD. And he had been the president of the mosque. In, in Moscow and was the person um, that all the university administrators and people at the banks, et cetera, they all knew him and they referred people to him when there was a new person from Saudi Arabia or from some mi Middle Eastern country. He was promoting, you know, he, he, he would help. Well, he also came from a good family in Saudi Arabia, um, a wealthy family. Um, Saudi Arabia is very wealthy, in fact, and uh, you don't even have to uh, uh, work uh, if, uh, if, if most people, because the oil is, they've, they've got such oil underneath their lands. Um, but 
he uh, donated lots of money to Islamic 501c3 organizations. So that caused the Justice Department suspicion, I bet. But um, you know, it all started. Well, I don't want to the whole thing. But anyway, so they they showed up and um, and charged him, and they interrogated all of the other Muslim uh, students and uh, members of the mosque, uh, finding nothing. Um, but thought that maybe they were involved too. But they just uh, charged Sami with violating some uh, visa. Uh, uh, regulations, Im immigration charges, and finally, um, after months, they added on some terrorism charges. Those were the ones that he was promoting and recruiting terrorist activity. Uh, well, how was he doing that? Well, he was a computer expert and was a webmaster, and he, mon he, he was the webmaster for a number of sites and helped others, but um, I saw some of the prosecution and uh, they had a big network of 20 or more uh, websites and how they were interconnected and you could get from one to the other to the other. And because essentially on one of them there were some, uh, some fat, fatwas, I guess they, they're pronounced fatwas, um, uh, promoting uh, suicide uh, attacks um, in, on the United States, I believe, um, they figured that was, that was their key piece. They finally found a link that took them. And of course, it was a, a First Amendment um, issue. Uh, that's why the ACLU wanted to be involved and we wanted to do a case because everybody has the right, do you not, to stand up on, in a pulpit and say, um, I, oh God, I, you know, Ann Coulter, the Republican, um, well, uh, not a leader, but a, a spokesperson. You know, she 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 wants some. What you converted to Christianity and um, et cetera. I think uh, you're supposed to be killed if you wouldn't do it or something. And and uh, you know, if I got on, if you can get on the soapbox and say that, um, you ought to be able to um, say also. If I got on the soapbox, I can say right now. You know, let's go out and fly bombing missions or fly planes into, in, into towers. Um, of course, you know, it's a, it, the context is different here, but nevertheless, you have, a, you have a right to do that so long as you don't say anything that puts people in imminent risk of, uh, you're not putting people at imminent risk of, of life or, or, or harm or breaking the law. Um, and so, he didn't even speak those words uh, on the website, but nevertheless, he was connected to it. Ultimately, the jury threw it out. They hung on some of these visa regs, and they, the, his attorneys made a deal with the U.S. Uh, AG to, um, to allow him to be uh, uh, shipped back. They were, would not appeal the um, immigration charges if the, if the government would just let him fly back to uh, Saudi Arabia where his family had been returned to anyway. But it, it's a wonderful, at some point, I think you'll hear David Nevin speak, and I'm trying to get him to speak up in, in, in Spokane. Um, he is the lead criminal defense attorney, lead attorney for SAMI, and he spoke at a number of places um, this year, and I was happy to get to hear it. It's a, it's a dramatic tale, and it's a, it's a real black mark, I think, on the Justice Department, because so much money was spent on this, and so much hardship was wreaked on these innocent people. And it was, you know, I don't think there was more to it really than the fact that he was mosque, and he, I mean, he was Muslim, and he was, um, he was involved in this computer stuff that caused them suspicion. Thank, thank you, Jack. And uh, I think, to his credit, David Niven did an incredible job uh, as a lawyer, but, but also, I think the, uh, the community of Moscow stood behind Sami so that uh, he was not, he was certainly uh, alone and in solitary and without his family, but he had a lot of, of support within uh, the Moscow community. Vinny has something that he'd like to say. <laughs> um, again, I, I'm sorry, I can't sit here and take sure. you with the bush bashing again. Um, <laughs> the whole, you know, let's, let's, let, let's back up a little bit. I totally agree with the whole Sami situation, the way it was horrible. It was awful the way it was done. 
Um, but let's also back up to what you just said. Um, 1993, the administration during that time, I believe, was Bill Clinton, which is the Democratic. You meant 2003, didn't you? Oh, I meant 2003. 2003. Okay. I did say 1993. That yeah, she did. But, but we all I, I was completely paying attention to that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. that was totally a mistake. Yeah, I, I thought it was that long, that long ago. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Just two years ago. It was in the late 2011. 2003, excuse me. Yeah. So um, my second question would be uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act, um, your thoughts on that? I don't know the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1996, is it, or what was it? It's um, 1996, it? yes. Can you find your mic, please? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know the Anti-Terrorism Act of that year. OK. Um, because actually, I have some um, something written here that says that actually uh, it was it was very, very similar to the Patriot Act um, in certain aspects, certain aspects with the anti-terrorism. Um, and also, I think the reason maybe why you don't know a whole lot about it is because the ACLU was actually against it mm -hmm. completely. And that was again during the Clinton administration. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's a Bush-Clinton thing no, or Republican-Democrat thing, but that's what you keep on okay. alluding to. Well, so I think we have to move past that all right. Bush administration thing. May, let me just remark because you know I want to talk about the SAFE Act and the Republican delegation in this state is being very good on promoting the SAFE Act. There have been Democrats who are just as bad as uh, the Republicans with respect to uh, the 1996 terrorism law. I, I believe you. Uh, we were probably against it. It was probably an overreaction to the Oklahoma City thing. Um, um, you know I, I will say however that it happens to be the Bush administration that is um, more than more than the Democrats. I mean, the, the, the Patriot Act was was a bipartisan thing. Yes, uh, especially in the um, in, in the was it the House or Senate Judiciary Committee, which um, crafted a reasonable piece of legislation. But then it got substituted by the Ashcroft folks in the middle of the night and at 3 a.m. Uh, the the bill that the that showed up on the desks of people wasn't the bill that the Senate Judiciary Committee had approved. And by 11 o'clock, they had to vote on it. Um, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm happy to um, minimize, to the extent that it um, feels good in my heart, to uh, minimize my comments about the Bush administration because I don't want to make it about that. I want to make it about reforming the, the Patriot Act in part, and I want to you know get to the point that yes, it is so, it, it's so good that real, what I call a real Republican, is somebody who is not obsessed with um, moral issues that ultimately in mean more government invasion on our privacy, our private lives, but are absolutely about limiting the role of government in into or with respect to invading the private lives of people. I would love to be a Republican if that's what it stood for. And to the extent that Republicans are about that, and I think some of these uh, SAFE Act proponents are coming at it from that standpoint, I'm all for it. That's great. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, panel. Uh, I think I spotted a hand. We're going to turn it over to you. Are you, you're first, you're first, and then you're second, and you're third, okay? What's your question? I think I have to repeat the question. Is that with the uh, open committee meetings at the state legislature and have at it. Bill. Well, if you look at the composition of the state legislature, you know, it's overwhelming Republican. And so when they have that kind of power, they can pretty well determine how the legislature functions. The press club is, has taken legal action. I don't know, is, uh, is the ACLU isn't uh, We're involved? We're doing an amicus brief on that. Okay, the well, the ACLU will be doing an amicus brief. But ultimately, obviously, it comes down to the public. And if the public holds these uh, legislators accountable for their actions, uh, we would hope that that practice would, uh, would end. You know, remember this at the next election, you know. 
uh, there's no there's no history that it has co that kind of an impact in the public consciousness, but we would hope that that would uh, occur. Any other response to that, Christian? Right to the editor, stand up and speak. Um, I think we all need to express our outrage at things like that if we feel it. That's my opinion. Let me just toss in as a former legislator, uh, it's very important to, to, to maintain the, the separation between what are caucus meetings, which are private party meetings, and when they close committee meetings. Committee meetings in either the House or the Senate have traditionally always been open, and that is the, the issue in this instance that uh, people should be upset about. Thank you. Who's the next question? Are you, st are you ready back there? Okay, the question is whether, when are we going to get off, off politics uh, or is it possible to separate politics from the right of privacy right now? That's one of the concerns. So I think right now. My question is for Mr. Van Goldenberg, and I think I can speak loud enough to get him to repeat my question. You, you talked about checks and balances, which I think certainly all of us agree with. In the Patriot Act, to get a warrant, you have to go in front of the judiciary. Every six months, there's also a report that goes to the legislature. So you have all three branches of government involved in that. Um, there are penalties in, for people violating Surveillance Act. I think please, that's please use your mic. Oh, yeah. Um, the Patriot Act expanded something that was created in the late 70s called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And that is a uh, law that was designed to deal with uh, spying. And it uh, was separate from the criminal justice process through which one needs to get probable cause and a search warrant going before a judge and then. Okay, um, and then you uh, um, can get a uh, warrant and then you could do the search. The Patriot Act expanded, well, what, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act has always simply provided that a, an FBI agent goes to a judge in uh, something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, I believe, which is, it's a federal judge, and it's a secret proceeding. You go and then you, um, you tell the judge that uh, you need an order to search, um, and it involves a foreign uh, agent um, because there's a threat of some sort. Well, uh, it used to be that you can get, you could only get that warrant when the primary reason for getting that warrant was because it was a foreign agent, there was a foreign threat, um, there was a terrorist activity planned or something. Uh, the Patriot Act changed it so that it's lowered now, so it's just a substantial reason. Uh, the agent needs to only have a substantial reason needs to be that. The rest of it could be for criminal purposes. So if they can link you to a group, for instance, that is involved in something foreign or, or something, um, that might be a substantial reason, um, even though the primary reason might be for doing criminal work. Um, in recent years, um, since 9-11, the number of warrants that have been obtained through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act um, have skyrocketed in relation to the number of, of, of uh, yes, there are now more than there are criminal ti Title III warrants. Uh, Title III warrants being those you can obtain through going before a judge, showing probable cause, getting a search warrant, et cetera. 
No probable cause is required by the court, by the judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. They don't ask you for probable cause. Um, they will give you that order and that is secret. And you don't learn, just as Sami al Hussein could not learn w about the phone calls that he had actually been a part of, about the emails, et cetera, that he had actually received and sent. Um, all of those thousands of communications were obtained by the federal agents um, and they were classified because it's, it's every all of that information that you get through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is classified. So you can't get at it unless you've got a security clearance. Well, you know, David Nevin and his law firm got a security clearance. They tried to get a translator because all of that is in Arabic, et cetera, and they couldn't um, get the translator's uh, clearance. So they went to trial without um, being able to see any of the evidence, essentially, that was going to be presented against them. Uh, at the ninth hour, Friday before the trial was to begin, the prosecutors uh, said they were going to institute declassification procedures so that if uh, David and Sami al Hussein wanted to postpone the trial once again, they could. But by this point, Sami had been in jail for 18 months, and he just wanted to get out. So he said, no, we're going to go forward with trial. You know, I know I'm innocent. And I don't care what is in those uh, emails and phone calls, et cetera. Um, it's funny, the translator um, was later hired by the government on a separate case and had no trouble getting a security clearance. It was just that for Sami al Hussein, the government would not give him a security clearance. He said there was some sort of obstruction. At any rate, it is different. Um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is being expanded. Um, makes things different and it allows for people like Sami to get busted and allows for his attorneys to have such hard time get, getting the evidence to defend them. Um, and I'm not saying that the Patriot Act or the Bush administration is all responsible. You know, you know all the Democrats who voted for that Patriot Act. But I do say it is a substantial um, invasion. Uh, just that portion of it. You can talk about the sneak and peek provisions or what we call the uh, What's the proper term for it? Um, delayed notice. It's called delayed notice because what it, you know you learn later that you've been searched. How much later? There's it. It's not defined. But um, so Congressman Otter referred to it as the sneak and peek provision that also would be reformed by the Safe Act that our that our con delegation is wanting to to correct. So. Thank you. Uh, sir, I evidently have been missing a hand that's over. Who's next? You were? You were answered, fine. Would you like to ask your question? And I do need to repeat it for the tape, please. I throughout all of the top corner forum I keep hearing that there's been nothing there's been nothing reported, any violations reported. Um, because of the Patriot Act or the government's behavior. But
So that's, thank you for your comment. Thank you. Um, any more questions, comments? Go ahead. The question is, uh, would, would they please address issues other than um, security and um, Patriot Act, et cetera? So any, anything more? Any, any particular issue you would like to have them address? Well, right, and the right to die, or the uh, or the, the okay, uh, reproductive freedom, or any of those. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. As you prob as you know, the ACLU only addresses um, things that relate to the Bill of Rights, which are those rights that um, we have as against the power of the government. So we aren't as involved um, in fighting for or fighting against the private invasions. But with respect to um, the the uh, the right to die, since we <laughs> or the Terry Chavo case, um, I know the ACLU of Florida actually did. We were co-counsel on behalf of the uh, the, the the husband, um, and I don't know the details of that issue. I suspect it involves the fact that um, he, um, as husband. Um, has the right, and it, the, there was the courts have been uh, numerous courts apparently have reviewed the evidence, and that um, she had communicated her wish not to uh, uh, have life, uh, extraordinary measures taken to save her life, um, and I, I believe that's the extent of our interest in in protecting that person's wishes, that per, the execution of that person's wishes. Um, you know, abortion rights, like the right to die, um, are very uh, controversial. And our perspective is that a woman's right to, um, as, as essentially to uh, private medical decisions, include her right to choose to terminate her pregnancy. We wish that, um, that abortions were, were rare uh, more rare than they are, uh, but um, we believe it is the right of the person, not of the government, to make that decision. Uh, generally, we oppose um, the, the sweeping pronouncements by Congress or by a state legislature um, that impact ev everybody's individual me medical decisions. We'd like to have that uh, decision made were allowed to be made between the person and their doctor. Can I just add a comment uh, to that quickly? That um, uh, the, uh, Terry Shiva was very, very young when she had that that accident, and so um, Jill was mentioning that you don't think about uh, a serious accident happening when you're young, but I think it's a good idea for um, everyone, no matter what your age is, to have a living will. I had the um, uh, I had the honor of carrying that in the Senate in 1988 uh, when it was passed, when our state law was updated. And uh, it's easy to get, um, and you just need to, to fill it out and, uh, and make sure it's in a, a place where somebody knows. Okay, question back there. Well, I, uh, I apologize to you guys. Um, this has been kind of more of a political debate uh, rather than you guys actually finding out exactly what I am thinking. And actually, quite honestly, we probably agree on many, many issues on the privacy versus public's right to know. I believe that privacy is an individual's right. Um, I believe that we all have the right to privacy. I don't believe that the government should have a stronghold over our you know, all of our personal records, all of our personal whatever, finances, um, 
what books you checked out of the library, whatever. Um, actually, I, I spent, I was fortunate enough to spend a, uh, quite a bit of time speaking with Congressman Butch Otter on this uh, issue. And actually, it seems that Congressman Butch Otter and I are pretty much right in, right in line with, uh, with how we think about privacy versus public's right to know. I believe that um, many things, not everything, but many things are, are the person's own personal right. Where it wouldn't be, um, where I, I think that a government could step over uh, the privacy boundary, if you will, is where there's a uh, case of sexually molested child or, again, the, um, the sex offenders. I think that they should be all, um, all registered. I believe in that. Um, so yeah, I apologize again that you guys didn't really, we never really got to where, where I stand on things. So. Thank you, Vinny. Um, Mills. Um, actually, I know both of those uh, individuals um, not very, very well, but I know them. Um, and depending on, on, I would have to say, depending on where that came from, if it was a private computer used at the home, which I don't think it was, I believe it was a public computer used at the office during um, the time that they're supposed to be doing the people's business, then I think that they should all be in the public's eye completely. I think it should be open to the press. And non-edited? Nope, non-edited, in their entirety. If you're an elected official, you have certain responsibilities. Your responsibility is to look after the people's best interest. That is it. I take that pretty seriously. Unfortunately, there are some individuals that do not. Um, not saying that this person is or isn't. I don't really want to get in any trouble up here, especially when it's being recorded. But um, <laughs> there's that whole, <laughs> whole privacy versus public's right to know thing. But, um, but no, I believe that they should, have, they should have been made public, open completely. 100% in their entirety, non-edited, and we should have uh, access to that completely. Julie, you'd like to Well, I, uh, th this is a story, kind of a story the press loves. Uh, you know, and the uh, railroad depot issue, it looks like it's pretty well settled down, so they've got to look something else. When Steve Smith was talking about the values of his newspaper, one of them was, uh, one of the, their, their concerns was a marketplace of ideas. And he was asked about how they choose to place articles in the newspaper and the stories they stress. He has, to, he has to, we have to focus on what the public is interested in. And so that's why we get uh, Kobe Bryant on the front page, uh, Britney Spears uh, brief, and unknown whether it was consummated marriage. Uh, the the uh, the spokesman review had a uh, editorial this morning about this whole thing, speculating about a possible romance. Well, you know that's that's a great story. The public loves it, and uh, the the interest is is the perception I get from Mr. Smith's point of view that the public's interests are superficial and, and rather limited, so they can't carry really substantive issues on the front page of the newspaper, they relegate those back to the interior of the, of the paper. Uh, so if you search assiduously enough, you'll find the substantive issues uh, currently extant. So it's, it's, what, it's what they perceive the public is interested in. And this is a wonderful story. Um, 
it may be a little late to kind of open this bailiwick, but the internet has opened an entire brave new world in the issue of privacy. Because the assumption of privacy when you seal a letter and mail it to someone, what with federal, um, you know, U.S. postal laws and tampering with mail laws, it's different than sending an email which kind of goes into cyberspace. Things can get misdirected, they can get deleted, um, people can see them, they can access them, they can go back to deleted emails, they can find your entire files, um, they can access which um, websites you've accessed, and law has not caught up, in my opinion. The law has not yet caught up with electronic um, and wireless communications with regards to our privacy. I would encourage anybody to be incredibly circumspect in what you are doing on the computer um, with our current um, legal system as regards to those issues. Beware, beware. We have a question over here. Well, yeah. If you don't want your credit card information out there, don't buy things online. You know, it's it's you know, easy. Well, that's I I I I agree, but I wonder, and I'm only beginning, thanks to this forum, you know, doing a little research on these European and Canadian privacy laws, and I I don't know how how much difference it makes, but I do know that um, that we're pretty unique in this country without how because we don't have such laws. Do you, there, was a, there was a question down here. Are you still? Yeah, we've got about we've got about four minutes. My question was: uh, Are those intended to be checked at home? And my question was: Does Price Point have high privacy checkpoints? And if Price Point doesn't have any um, restrictions on who can talk to, what happens when there's 55,000 customers or a major customer? The question has to do with Choice Point and its 55,000 customers. And the question really is, what, what, why don't they have some regulation? And, and, and are the people farther down the, the stream, do they know they're coming in? So right. Do they buy it from price okay. I mean, unless okay, there's a Jack, contractual provision between those, the buyer and the seller, they're totally free to, to do what they wish with the information. Okay. We, have, we have Ron uh, Wiesmeyer. You can have the last question, Ron. Last word. Well, the, the panel gets the last word.
Well, that's a good statement, and I have to repeat what we said earlier, which is that uh, Jeff uh, Jacoby had to, uh, to climb on a plane. I think you would agree, all agree, that this morning's debate was, was very evenly balanced and very lively. I didn't say anything about the debate. I said Jeff. Okay, all right. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, and let's say thank you to our panel and to Jeff Van Valkenburg. And, and thank you. Tony, do you have any announcements to make before, what's the time tomorrow, 9 a.m.?